Uh, everything. So, okay. So the first present, uh, presentation is um, Leon Keynes. Um, his presentation is about the philosophical life of um, Somaistic um, practice, Katai, the Japanese arts of um, body. Um, Leon, I believe he's a PhD student, aren't you? In yeah. the uh, Hildesheim University. And uh, yeah, okay, so mm -hmm. the, the time is on yours. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm going to present kind of a topic from my uh, PhD thesis, which is kind of a crazy uh, project where I try to combine um, current theories about embodiment and uh, phenomenological accounts of, of the body with um, a Japanese uh, picture of of practicing or of performance. So I had a longer um, script, but I kind of put it all in the trash bin and uh, re restructured it all. So I hope I'm not telling something too too jumbled up and too chaotic today. So I have to apologize um, for for any inconsistencies. So. Um, as I said, I want to combine um, Japanese uh, notions of practice and embodiment theories which we find in, in, in contemporary philosophy. Um, I will try to speak a bit about the alternative notion of practice in uh, Sino-Japanese philosophy um, before I come, come to my, the center of my presentation, which is the notion of kata in performative arts uh, in Japan. And the phenomenological theories I um, use in my dissertation are from mainly Merleau-Ponty and Hermann Schmitz. Um, I, I think I, I, I won't have the time to kind of elaborate here on these theories. Um, but yeah, I don't know, maybe not so many people know Hermann Schmitz. He's a German uh, phenomenologist, kind of a, um, he's kind of the founder of the new phenomenology um, centering of of something which is akin to um, um, somatic interoception, interoceptive awareness in contrast to, to outer perception. And then there, is, there are the so-called 4E, which is um, an activism, embodiment, extended mind and emb embedded mind, which are theories from, from the English speaking world, um, which also center on the body, but kind of in a different way than phenomenology. Sometimes they combine, sometimes they kind of have opposite directions. And another thing that I want to bring in um, in my dissertation is um, that there is a current, um, a current move in philosophy to revive a philosophical Lebenskunst, um, as, a, as, as we say in German, it's kind of way of life, a philosophical way of life, of self-care, caring for oneself, um, which was made prominent, uh, prominent again by uh, Ado and uh, Foucault who um, described these kind of practices in ancient Greek and Hellenism, sto uh, like Stoic and Epicurean schools. Yeah, and then um, I want these um, theories I want to use to kind of understand what's going on in the uh, Japanese so-called Michi or Do, um, which are mostly um, like Budo, uh, martial arts and um, other aesthetic practices like Sado, the, the way of tea. So I'm, for me it's not m um, mainly a kind of um, philological study of, of uh, what um, Japanese philosophers said about it and what um, Western philosophers said about it, but I want to kind of find a creative combination of both. So it's more kind of, um, I'm engaged in more kind of creative thinking, uh, which is still in process. Yeah. So, um, when I talk of Japanese notions of, um, of practice, I'm thinking mostly of um, thinkers like Dogen, who was a, a Zen Buddhist writer, and, and his um, notions of uh, Shusho Itto, which is uh, his notion of the unity of practice and confirmation, which means that practice has its confirmation in itself and not in a telos outside of itself. So you don't practice to gain something outside of practice, but you practice to deepen this, this practice in itself. 
as a kind of self-deepening of practice, through practice. And uh, the other notion he has is um, Shin Shin Ichinyo, which is, um, I have translated it here as body and mind as one suchness. So it's also a kind of way to um, have a am more ambivalent view on body and mind so that they can blur into each other. <laughs> And then there are modern accounts, um, for me mainly, uh, Nishida Kitaro's notion of koi teki chokkan, which can be translated in different ways. The most traditional one is, uh, I would say, active intuition. Um, but then there are other, um, other, other ways to translate it, um, like an active intuition, embodied intuition, performative intuition, or transformative intuition. Which, um, which can bring this uh, Nishida's notion closer to, to, the, to the contemporary discourse. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I listed some uh, literature um, to show that there is already an ongoing um, movement um, with some, some uh, theories or some writers who try to, to think about meditative practices or um, aesthetic practices in Japan as kind of philosophical practices and uh, who combine it with uh, an, an activism or um, uh, Muraldo, for example, tried to show um, the differences and uh, uh, um, the kind of um, similarities between Nishida's Koi Teki Chokan and the notion of an action co cognitive science. Or there, there was a, um, a vol volume on martial arts and philosophy and um, there, for example, Markus Schrenk um, had an essay on, uh, on the question, if proprioceptive art is possible. And I think this kind of proprioceptive, interoceptive aspect of, the, of, of bodily practice is very important for understanding uh, the Japanese Do Omichi. Then there's the classic by Minamoto Ryo-en, um, who, who, who wrote the book, which is called Kata. So it's kind of the classic on, on the topic of Kata. In, uh, it's in Japanese. There, I think there's no full translation, although there's an excerpt in the, in the source book, I think. The, the second book. The, the second one, ah, Kata Bunka, yeah. And there's, for example, Yuasa Yasuo, who, um, who tried to um, find a synthesis between Eastern and Western theories of the mind and of the body. Okay. Uh, no, let's, where are we, sorry. Um, I think one of the most characteristic features um, of the Sino-Japanese notion of practice is that spiritual practice is always performed as a bodily practice. Um, as John Moraldo writes in his essay, this can be compared to Aristotle's account of practice as a habitualized embodiment of a golden mean, but it con can also be contrasted with one of the main streams of classical European philosophy, which interprets the body as a mere means to the end of a perfection of the mind, or even sees it as a basis uh, of all passions which disturb the serenity of pure self-knowledge. According to Plato, the real philosopher has to learn how to completely separate body and soul so that the latter can reach insight into ideal knowledge. In, uh, in his dialogue Phaedon, the body is even described as a prison of the soul. The central importance which is attributed to the body and certain Japanese notions of practice uh, can be seen in Dogen's detailed instructions for seated meditation or in the stress on bodily technique as seen in Zeami's tre treatises on no theater. There's a famous passage from Zeami's uh, treatise Fu Shikaden which says, if you want to know the flower, first familiarize yourself with its seed. The flower is the mind, the seed is the performative technique. The Japanese word waza, which I have translated in this passage as performative technique, can be written with different Chinese character, characters which express different aspects of this notion. The respective meanings of waza oscillate between technical skill and more artistic and mental, uh, more kind of artistic and uh, mental virtuosity may be similar to the broader meaning of the Greek word uh, techne. In any case, we can say that it denotes a practical knowing how instead of a theoretical discursive knowing that. It is a practical technique which has to be repeatedly practiced and in this sense it is very close to what is generally, des generally designated as kata, 
in the Japanese practices of embodiment, or the michi, or do. The connection between waza and kata can also be seen in the fact that both the characters Zeam uses for waza, as well as uh, one of the characters for kata, can also be read as nari, which I have tried to show here. So, the one above is um, the one Zeami uses for waza or technique, and uh, the one below is kata, and both can also be traditionally read as nari. The word kata is etymologically connected to katameru, to become rigid or to solidify. It designates a form, a pattern, or a model which is accepted as normative prototype to be emulated and repeatedly practiced. In the performative arts and embodiment practices, kata are bodily patterns of posture or movement which have been abstracted from paradigmatic contexts like uh, meditation or combat or from everyday practices like serving tea or writing calligraphy. These abstracted patterns of performative practice are continually, continually refined in an attempt to reach their most essential or basic form in a long process of repetitive enactment and are passed on from master to disciple in the respective arts. According to Minamoto Ryoen, kata can be defined in the following way. The expression kata has the meaning of a form of a form. So actually this sign is also, this is also a symbol for kata, but he tries to distinguish between the one writing and the other. Kata can generally be defined as distinguished patterns which have been selected from conscious or unconscious bodily emotions and which have been adopted in a dedicated effort to refine and solidify them. In other words, they are forms which are perfected by possessing a perceptible shape and at the same time transcending it. As something which transcends its outer shape, kata is similar to eidos. But while an eidos is something purely transcendent, which simply surpasses uh, perceptible shapes, a kata cannot realize itself except in perceptible forms. So just as an eidos is the conceptually comprehended essence of an entity, a kata can be conceptualized as the universal essence of a performative act or a performation. But in contrast to, the, to eidos, uh, in kata, the material, sensible, or performative manifestation of a kata receives its meaning only from participating in its ideality. But the sensuously perceptible embodiment of the kata is itself the genuine medium in which the kata realize its, realize it, it realizes itself fully. The kata, the essence of a performative act, has no existence independent or pre-existent to its embodiment in time and space but is only realized in the moment it is performed and practiced by living human beings. By the way, Minamoto explicitly links the, his interpretation of kata to Nishida's concept of immanent transcendence, in which immanence and transcendence mutually express each other, but um, I won't have the time now to, to deepen this. A kata might transcend its concrete actualizations in the sense that it repre represents the ideal of an optimum pattern of performative practice and that it can be transmitted intersubjectively from one body to another. Nevertheless, it is radically affected by the temporality of the sensible world in being subject to change according to the contingencies of the individuals and communities who perform it. Kata can therefore be described as performative artifacts, which cannot be objectively recorded or stored in an archive but only be performatively embodied in each new instance. A performative embodiment of kata, mimetically acquired from other human beings, therefore manifests a twofold process. The kata transforms and universalizes the practitioner, and the concrete bodily structure of the practitioner transforms and individualizes the kata. According to Yuasa Yasuo, one of the basic approaches to practice in the Japanese embodiment arts is to transform the structure of consciousness by restructuring the body, by giving oneself a specified bodily form or kata. 
By becoming a certain cutter, the practitioner's being in the world is transformed in the way he or she habitually perceives and interacts with his or her environment. In this sense, the embodiment of a cutter is both, both a restructuring of the objective body, in German the Körper, as well as a transformation of the lived body, or Leib in German, as experienced in proprioceptive and interoceptive self-awareness. In this bodily mode of awareness, the practitioner can develop and deepen a relation to him or herself, which is not based on a conceptual self-knowledge, but on a performative perception and transfiguration of him or herself as a radically embodied subject, finding itself in a web of inter interrelations with other bodily entities. Uh, I would like to go on and draw closer connections between my interpretation of kata and phenomenological terminology, but I think that this would exceed the limits of this presentation. I will just briefly mention some more aspects concerning kata in a more schematically way. So I think that kata as a, as a basic pattern of embodiment can, can be used to bridge the gap be, be, between what might be called percept and concept. So percept as a certain pattern of perception and concept as a certain pattern of thinking could be bridged by kata as a basic unit of embodied practice. I also think that um, the kata practice um, can be paralleled to Zen Buddhist practice in some way. So there is an, uh, an essay by Izutsu Toshihiko on um, Zen Buddhism where he tries to show the Zen Buddhist way of practicing as a de-reification and re-reification of the things in the world. Which means that he tries to show that at the beginning um, the practitioner has an objective world where um, all the objects are kind of opposed to each other. And then, uh, and also his self is kind of opposed to the phenomena, phenomena he perceives. But the, in the process of practice, um, both the, the subject is desubjectified and the objects are deobjectified and kind of blur into to each other, and so that you get a kind of ambivalent experience where, where the borders are not so clear. And I think that uh, the kata is kind of something like this, it's an objective, you, you have an objective kata which is presented to you by the master and you try to emulate it, by which you try to uh, transform the objective content of the kata which you perceive uh, in, in, in visual perspective, uh, per perceptive, perception, into uh, more interoceptive qualities of your, self, of your uh, bodily self-awareness. So I think it's a kind of a translation process from visual experience into interoceptive awareness. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Um, then uh, there's um, Minamoto in his work on kata. He, dis uh, he um, tries to distinguish between kata in a very narrow sense, which is like the kata you know from karate or something. Um, Cutter, which are pretty objectively um, transmittable. And then cutter in a, more bro in a broader sense, um, which also encompasses more kind, more something like a what it is likeness of performance. So I think that these cutter in the, in the, in the broader sense are very uh, interesting in connecting um, the cutter practice to phenomenological accounts. Um, as I said before, I want to interpret these, um, these broader kata in a, as a kind of what it is likeness of the embodiment and of the artifacts which, is, which are derived from the performance, like in uh, Sado, the, the, the tea bowl. I think it's also an embodiment of, of these qualitative aspects, what it is likeness. It, it tries to, not to show something objective, but uh, what it is likeness of performing and of living in the world. So we have, for example, um, these threefold structures um, like Jo Hakyu, which is from North Theatre, um, and it's, uh, it generally um, describes um, a slow be beginning of a performance, which then uh, gets faster and faster until it, it ends in a, in a 
kind of um, very fast finale. Then we have something like uh, Shuhadi, from, uh, which is from the uh, Way of the Tea, um, Sado, and which describes the way the practitioner, um, the, the relation of the practitioner to the kata. Um, so it starts with um, uh, Shu, which is kind of the preservation um, of the kata in, its, in, the, in the traditional form. So you, you try to stay um, close to the, the kata you saw from, from the master, for example. Uh, then again, ha, like in the first, it's the same, uh, it's the same kanji, ha, rupture, and then a kind of distancing from the kata to... I had a very interesting explanation by Jim Heisig, uh, where, he, uh, where I think he tried to, to say that um, the, the rupture phase is kind of trying to just change some small uh, detail. That's the, uh, the ha. Ah, okay, that's, yeah, that's the ha. Yeah, I mean the ha. I, I, yeah. And, uh, and then after you, 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 you have accomplished this, then you, you can just start to, to kind of distance yourself from the kata to, to, to see what you have accomplished kind of objectively. So uh, thank you for this very interesting interpretation. I want to hear more about it. Um, and then there's, for example, Shin Gyo So, which is um, the way you perform, for example, in calligraphy. Um, the first one would be a very formal way of writing uh, a kanji very traditional and very close to the um, like perfect form. And then gyo is more like semi-formal. You, 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 you don't do every stroke and it's kind of more freely expressed. And the, the, the later one, so, is, is then a very free expression where, for example, if you have a, uh, a kanji with seven strokes, then you connect them into, into two, or th two or one stroke. And it's kind of more expression of, an, of a free, uh, of an embodiment of freedom, something like that, in a, in a, in a bodily way. <clears throat> then we have um, expressions from traditional Chinese and Japanese philosophy like Jinen, which I think are very interesting in, um, in dealing with the performative practice of these arts. Uh, Jinen uh, means something like, like this by itself. Um, and the first of these kanjis is also um, read in Japanese as onozukara, which means by itself. So, onozukara, um, if I should try to kind of give qualities of uh, onozukara or by itselfness, um, it would be something like a, um, an artificial naturalness, which is acquired after a long process, process of repeating an artificial kata and it becomes natural. Then uh, it can be seen as a transformation of activity into a mode of passivity. But this passivity is itself very, um, very aware. It's a, it's a kind of um, heightened self-awareness, but in which you, I think, perceive your own activities as a kind of perception. So it, it kind of gets uh, in between activity and passivity. So it's kind of an expression of what what is the middle voice in, in grammar um, as, a, as a verbal or performative quality between active and passive? And then uh, in connection to, for example, Zen Buddhism, I think that we have to look at very concrete bodily practices which are performed in, uh, in, the, in the Michi or Do to see how they try to um, concretize the abstract concepts from philosophy to bring them into everyday life. So, for example, there's the practice of Enzan no Metsuke in, uh, in, in the practice of uh, drawing the sword, Iaido, which means that you, the way you, you see um, is decentralized. So you don't concentrate on a certain object, but kind of create a field-like visual percep um, perception. And I think you can um, go further and say that you um, don't just stay with this visual field, but you expand your awareness to also other, other fields of perception, also interoceptive awareness, awareness which is close, closely connected to what is called uh, chi or ki in Sino-Japanese philosophy. So in this concrete act of Enzan no Metsuke, there is a kind of performative realization of the theories which we find in traditional uh, Sino-Japanese philosophy. And I think it's very interesting to see how this concretization of, the, of the, these abstract concepts can be 
phenomenological, phenomenologically described. I think we have to do a phenomenology of, of these practices. Okay, I think um, I can end here and thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe everybody would like to have like hours to listen to Leo's speech, but we have to go to the questions. So I'd like to have like five minutes of questions. So Professor Heisig first, maybe. Um, if, if you take kata, as you said at the very beginning, as a kind of discipline for unifying the mind and body, so the shin yin, shin yin, shin yin. The question is, how do you prove, or how does the practitioner know? when mind and body have been unified. I mean, we know how to unify the concepts of mind and body. That's a logical process. But how do you know? Now, if, if mind, by nature, fragments the body, divides it into its senses, into its activities, into its pains, and its pleasure, right? But the body um, unifies, well, by the very fact that we're bound in the skin. So the question is, maybe kata is a way of restoring mind body, or of, of unifying in the body what the mind has fragmented. Mm -hmm. So if, if you just take that as one part of what you're talking about, how do I know that that's happened? That I become one with the flower, or that I have this wider perception you were just talking about? Isn't one of the ways the experience of synesthesia? You know, on the, on the little plates that they sell uh, for incense, for burning incense in Japan, often they have two characters written there, monko, which means to uh, listen to the fragrance. <laughs> so the idea of synesthesia, where uh, this unifying of the body happens because the senses get mixed up. Yeah. Uh, is, is that like one thing that you could teach a practitioner to say, well, now you're getting there, or, or you've achieved it? Or are there other ways of proving demonstrating that you actually did unify mind and body. Yeah, I, I think um, that's a very um, difficult question, um, the kind of uh, how, you, how you can prove like, what, that you have attained this kind of state. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you mentioned is kind of a phenomenological um, first-person way of yeah. trying to find a proof. Uh -huh. So I think it's, uh, you are very, uh, it's a very good um, proposition to say that uh, the synesthesia gets um, kind of more of more interactions between different fields of perception and a kind of more integrative field, a broader field of perception. That, that's kind of what I also wanted to tr uh, try to show with Enzano Metzger. It's a kind of, of broadening the field but without, um, uh, without um, uh, annihilating like the, the different fields. The different fields kind of can uh, interpenetrate into each other in this, this kind of field-like perception. So yeah. But the other thing is that kata are also objectively um, performed, so there should also be, apart from this first-person account, a third-person account of, uh, of, of the um, accomplishment of the kata practice, I think. So in the way somebody moves in objective space, I think this can show something uh, which is accomplished, accomplished in this performative practice. And also, um, I mentioned the, the tea bowl. I think the tea bowl is a, is a manifestation of, of this performative um, uh, attainment that one has gained and which, which one then puts into the, back into the objective world. I also think that it's not just unity but that it's kind of a paradoxical interpretation of, of unity and um, uh, opposition. So Izutsu also mentions in his um, description of Zen Buddhist practice that after you, you de-subjectify the subject and de-objectify the objects, you return to re objectifying the object and re-subjectifying the subject. So if you don't this, do this returning movement, then, then you stay in a kind of uh, one-sided mysticism, I think, and, and you won't have any social or uh, inter, intersubjective, intersubjective connection. So I think it's very important that... Okay. So um, maybe one more um, short question. Okay, Paulus. <coughs> What I did not understand was it was a passage when you were talking about the uh, you know, and the concept of compass, as you say, and uh, he seems to have this idea that uh, a certain kind of kata transcends form. And I didn't really understand where the transcendent is here. So maybe you could say something more about that. 
Yeah, I, I personally also find it problematic, Minamoto's account in this passage, because um, you can get the impression that it's one-sidedly going into the direction of transcendence, like that, that there's something um, getting away from the, from the uh, um, perceptible performance. But I think that, that there might be some kind of, uh, that there, some kind of differentiation occurs. So there's a kind of, of um, differentiation of aspects, but I don't think that the cutter kind of differentiates itself from itself and becomes a higher order cutter or something like that. I think it's problematic to think in this way, in kind of higher order um, forms or something. So, for me, it's also um, a bit problematic to, to link it to, to Eidos. But I just wanted to show that Minamoto tries to kind of link it, but then tr um, to distinguish it also from Eidos. Um, yeah. yeah, but I, I agree with you that's not yeah. unproblematic. I, have a question for Professor Murray. Yeah. I wonder if it would be valuable for you as a, a source for your work to uh, particularly um, with regard to the Japanese though or body arts to um, like interview some of the teachers. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I, and, I, and see, I mean, perhaps you've already done this. Or no, I haven't. Uh, to, but to I see, see how they, for example, sort of, um, deal with this question or yeah, yeah. these issues. Yeah, I, I think um, because it's a kind of performative, there's nothing apart from the performative practice kind of, it always reintegrates into the performative practice. I think it's, it's very important to, because also because of the, the question of, of, of the description of, concrete description of the what it is likeness of, this, of these performative patterns that, that you, um, yet you look at the kind of masters who are accepted as masters of these arts and, and try to describe what you perceive at them, for example, or you, you, you look at the at a tea bowl, and you try to describe what 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 is it that makes it kind of an expression of um, of of, of onozukara or something. So, but these are very you have to use very subtle descriptions, I think, and you get to a more kind of literal mode of description or a poetic mode of description. Um, but you can't simply come as an outsider and describe the tea yeah. bowl or something. It yeah, that's you true. Have to be, yeah, you have, you have to, to do mm, some degree of practice yeah. of I, the. Of the Mm. For, for me, it's also connected to um, my, my, teach, my teacher at Hildesheim, Rolf Elberfeld, he has this notion of performative um, phenomenology, mm -hmm. which is kind of the notion that you have to perform to describe phenomenology, uh, phen phenomenologic, phenomenologi ah, in a phenomenological, phenomenological <laughs> place, <yeah. Yeah. laughs> to do phenomenology. Yeah, yeah. So you have to practice, you have to uh, perform. Mm -hmm. So this is very closely connected, I think, to, to what I'm trying to do, and uh, in my case I'm doing Aikido, but I would like to have much more experience in, in these different ways, but you know, it's, it's a kind of lifelong process, so I'm, <laughs> I can't wait till I'm a uh, monkey or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you everybody for the comments, and thank you.